Hello, everybody. Just going to apologize in advance. I'm fighting off a little bit of a cold, so hopefully I, my voice is going to hold up for uh, the duration here. Um, I'm assuming, I uh, can't see the audience too well, but how many people in the audience have heard of Stack Overflow? Tech audience here? Quite a few of you. That's, that's good. Um, yeah, actually, um, just for those who haven't heard of Stack Overflow, um, Stack Overflow, I would say, is the, the world's largest community of programmers. Um, at this point um, at the company, um, what do you call it? The uh, community that we serve is about uh, 40 million people monthly use Stack Overflow as a question and answer community for programmers. And we run somewhere between 2 and 3 billion, with a B, page views per month. It's a massive site serving those 40 million users and something like 15 million professional programmers around the world um, on a daily basis. So my um, coming to Stack Overflow is actually my technical background. Um, as he mentioned, uh, was a, a founder and CTO of a company, a tech company uh, that exited in 2008. And um, during my sort of 15 or 20 year tenure doing that, did quite a bit of work uh, developing software and building and scaling teams through a couple different companies, actually, through my, through my history um, and earlier career be before coming to Stack. So today, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, scaling software development teams and basically uh, concepts around minimizing technical debt and even what the definition of that really means, actually. So the first question is, um, if you're in a project or a company, um, a team that's suffering from technical debt, what are the types of things you typically experience um, going on? Um, most of this are going to be, anybody who's a developer is going to be familiar with these ideas. Um, but obviously, it's things like schedule slips and unpredictability in the schedule. Uh, frequent need to refactor code. People are rewriting things on a, on a regular basis um, or somehow can't make it do what they want it to do. Um, inconsistent output of new features is tied into that irregularity of shipping software where there seems to be fits and starts in terms of your ability to ship code successfully. Um, sometimes the engineers need to go back and do more work, um, change a lot of things under the hood before you what, can get out what seems like probably to the business side of the company or the salespeople um, an easy feature, right? And so um, another sort of attribute that I think of here in technical debt is the idea that you're trying to scale up your team and get more productivity and more output over time to serve your business better, but somehow adding developers isn't really speeding up the efficiency of the team. And in fact, I always like this idea of this inverse staffing law. Sometimes in many teams, uh, the best way to speed things up is to actually take people off the team rather than add them to the team. And then, um, you know, just the idea that bugs go out regularly, um, the code is buggy on a regular basis, or you get frequent regressions. You push new code, something breaks unexpectedly. All these different types of sort of classic software development technical debt problems. So kind of the, the thing I wanted to, to turn, into, or turn this over into is this idea that um, that's sort of the classic form of technical debt. And really, that um, there's really two different types of technical debt. So the, the kind that I was talking about there mostly has to do with the idea that the technical debt is um, due to a lack of robustness in the actual implementation of the code in terms of the code construction itself. But there's really a whole different type of class of technical debt, which relates to the fact that um, it's sort of hard to move your code base forward with the progression of your product. Not because it's necessarily bugs or uh, poor software construction from an implementation perspective, but because the code base itself doesn't really easily adapt to the evolving business problem that you're trying to solve. And I'm going to claim that that's actually the most insidious, um, difficult part of technical debt. And in fact, um, I think it was the uh, Basecamp guys with um, 37 Signals, where they had talked about and did a big blog post bragging about how they had rewritten their entire code base over again to ship the next version of software because it needed to do something fundamentally different than it did before. But I think from a customer standpoint, that doesn't seem like a really great solution when none of the data in the history that you had using that product in the past needed to leap forward to the next version. They were sort of imposing that on their customer base. And so really, the core of what I want to talk about here is the idea of what you can do to prevent those types of technical debt from occurring and how to think about this problem a little bit differently. Um, and in fact, uh, after the talk here today over at, um, on the Tech Plus stage, um, I have a longer session set up. Uh, instead of just the, sort of this 25-minute uh, introduction here, I'm going to have a whole hour and a half to meet and talk with people uh, relative to getting into more of the details around this. So for the rest of the presentation here, I'm just going to try to give you a quick overview of the, of the concepts behind what I'm talking about here and this whole idea of the sort of agile um, waterfall continuum that leads to what I believe are ways of minimizing technical debt. So first of all, before we dive into that, 
I just want to put a more formal definition down of technical debt, and it's basically what I described there of this idea that where your code is evolving to or what it needs to do to solve your business problems uh, better is actually um, not aligned well with the code that you actually have. In other words, what is easy to do with your code base and your data structures doesn't match up with what you want to be easy to do with the business problems that you have. And so that underlying layer of um, the internals of the, the system architecture of the product is really where the core of this resides. And I think um, things around agile development actually work against the properties that actually lead to minimizing this type of technical debt. So I, I think the most way, common way that this is experienced in teams is that um, you know, when you get things started and you have this very agile approach to developing things, there's a fast iteration. Um, in a sense, um, you have a well-defined problem that you're solving. You are your own customer, and you're trying to scratch that itch of the solution that you have. And you need to go through an agile process of fast iteration of getting something going and established in the marketplace. But basically, what I'm going to argue is that the, the things that you do in those earlier stages are exactly different and unstructured relative to what you need to do to, to do long term to actually scale the product and the business very rapidly. I call this the hot coals of growth, where you do very well and it seems like everything's really good and efficient for the beginning year or years early on, but then as you really start to scale up the product and try to serve into more markets, um, the code base feels very non-spongible to the types of things that you want to be able to do, and you get into this phase where it seems very hard and expensive to ship features that everybody in the business knows they need to do or want. And so, in a sense, this whole idea here is to be able to prevent that from occurring, or at least what you do to solve it um, once you're in it. And at, th at the core of this is what I would call customer-compelled versus market-focused. Um, we talk about this a lot in terms of feature development, but I, th the core idea is that the debt that I'm talking about here comes from um, being compelled not only in how you're developing the feature set, but also how the underlying code base is being developed. And that's because of this fast iteration cycle that sort of works against the idea of advanced planning, that even though people, um, I think, in a sense, confuse the difference between um, uh, iteration and increments of software development. In other words, you're in a fast iteration cycle, but you're not really considering the increments that need to be taken to actually solve the underlying longer-term business problem that's there. So in a sense, once again, the, the whole idea here is to um, basically set it up so that you can avoid those hot crawls, and as time progresses, that the features and the, whole, the idea of whole product quality and your ability to ship code sort of remains linear or even accelerates over time rather than slows over time due to that underlying technical debt. And the key point here is actually that this happens in the eyes of your customer, not in the eyes of your code base. So in other words, from an internal perspective, when the software developers are developing, I'm quite sure that in most cases, people are developing the code just as fast as they were developing it before in terms of lines of code generated. But the problem is, is that, in a sense, there's things going on where things are getting thrown away. You're rewriting stuff to start um, solving a different type of problem or an evolving set of problems relative to your business. And so the, the real way you want to be thinking about this is what do you do to make the, the software development progress appear consistent and linear from your customer's point of view so that you can serve the business in the most efficient way possible. Another way to look at this, I, I talk about one of the key points to scaling here is just that um, what are you doing essentially to design and develop your system so that you're bringing your customers and their data along with you on your roadmap as you're developing software. The whole idea is to minimize disruption in the code base and also to minimize disruption uh, relative to what your customers see in terms of your output and your ability to deliver um, increasing functionality to them. Um, so this kind of leads to the holy wards. Um, in other words, we've got to talk about software process here a little bit and get maybe a little bit more to the meat of exactly what's going on here and how you start attacking some of the things that I'm talking about. So everyone agrees, right? Agile, good. Waterfall, bad. Waterfall, old school. Agile, good stuff. Only the old guys like me use waterfall or something like it. All the new people, new kids on the block use agile, right? Interesting thing to think about. Good properties of Agile. Admits that requirements evolve, extremely important. Can't know everything in advance for sure. Encourages regular releases, which allows the validation of progress more often. I think that's really the value in the releases is that you get the check-ins to make sure that not only your requirements are right, but also that your code's progressing in the way it's expected. Um, the sprints and the sprint concept within Agile and the scrums and the stand-up are great for driving what I call cadence 
the rate at which the team is moving. Um, those properties are very desirable to have a consistent output from the team. That's clearly a business goal and a technical goal, I think, to have consistent cadence. Sprints and the agile thinking are great for that. Um, and then the most important thing, I think, in the end is that it closes loop on quality. Um, what you're doing with the scrum boards, how you're tracking features, the backlog, everything in there to do with the scrum stuff is great because it's basically a self-evaluating process that closes the loop on quality. And so those are awesome properties of agile. Pitfalls of agile. And to be clear, too, um, in the formal definitions of this stuff, um, I think agile processes and process descriptions does a good job of sort of avoiding some of these pitfalls. But the thing I'm going to argue here, and the thing to be aware of everybody, I think, is that in common practice, uh, agile um, runs in these pitfalls on a very common basis because people sort of, in a sense, abuse the process. Um, so the first one is that any form of scheduling beyond a few sprints seems non-existent to me in agile and most teams anyway. Um, there's this idea that basically it implicitly um, drives feature-driven thinking. In other words, the backlog and everything you have on the scrum board are all features. And everybody's thinking about what to do to get the next feature done and to push that functionality. The question is, is what's going on in the background relative to the code base that's actually delivering on those features? And how much are you, are you getting sort of sucked into iterative development versus um, iterations of development? And so, in a sense, the, the incremental nature of Agile in, encourages shortcuts to being taken. Um, lighter specs, lighter documentation. Um, the code's the perfect spec, so let, why bother writing it down in advance? We'll just code it and then ship it, and it's perfectly explained to everybody. Extreme programming, I think. I used to work with the guy that wrote one of the books on extreme programming, and they sort of took this to this logical conclusion, like, we can't decide any of this stuff in advance, so the spec is done when we ship the code and we know it works kind of thing. Um, kind of crazy talk from my perspective. And, and basically, what's going on here with Agile is exactly what I put on the slide, is why plan or document things in too much detail when we know that the requirements are going to change anyway? And so, in a sense, all of these things are the, the, the underlying pitfalls to what's going on in Agile, I think. Now, go, let's go shift over the waterfall and what's good about that. Formal specifications rule, right? Um, the more you can write down before you write the code is the cheaper it is to make changes, the quicker bugs, in a sense, are discovered, right? because in this case, requirements bugs. If we can write down on a piece of paper something that's going to take days to code, um, you're obviously getting a good savings, assuming that those specifications are correct, right? So I consider that a good property of waterfall. Um, it emphasizes detailed planning. Planning is never bad. And um, when people talk about this, you know, it's like, oh, let's stop thinking about what we're going to do. We can just start coding it kind of thing, I think, is a, is a common pitfall in Agile, where in Waterfall, um, you basically can't, you live and die by doing good specifications and good planning. Otherwise, these 12-month-long release cycles that you have would just never possibly work at all. Um, and then in Waterfall, I think another really good property is the fact that system design specifically is a thing. In other words, if you look at a Waterfall fl flowchart diagram, there's a very specific block after you do requirements discovery and planning that you actually have system design occurring. In Agile, this is sort of easily skipped over. Um, and in a sense, if you can do the requirements really well and you have a good software development team, Waterfall, I'm going to claim, is actually the most efficient way you could possibly develop software. Now, it's obviously a big if to get all that stuff right, and I don't think you actually can, but this leads to some provocative thinking from my point of view about what's really going on in Waterfall and why it has some of these advantages. Now, clearly, Waterfall has some pitfalls, and this is um, things that are people are perfectly aware of, usually. Um, the one I've already been talking about quite a bit, the requirements are never perfect. The idea that requirements are evolving is clearly not really a considered thing in Waterfall. Um, it encourages very long serial re release cycles because of the way the planning stages work. Um, spec everything, design everything, build everything, and test everything. Um, this is kind of a flip side to its advantage, but um, clearly when the requirements aren't well defined and you have these long stages, it could be months or even years, perhaps, before you discover a requirements bug or an implementation bug just because of the way the software is being developed. So we don't obviously like that property of Waterfall very much. And this leads to what I just said there, which is problems, in a sense, are discovered late, whether it's a requirements bug, an um, implementation bug, design problem, interfaces, whatever. Um, all the pitfalls here of Waterfall. So in a sense, one of the observations I want to make here is that everything you think about is the pitfalls of Agile are basically the strengths of Waterfall. And anything that are the strengths of Agile um, are pretty much the pitfalls of Waterfall on the other side. And so when you take these into common, then it really starts to make you think about 
these aren't really two separate extremes, but they're actually a, a series of trade-offs that you're making about how you actually approach software development at the various layers within your systems um, and the services that are being built to deliver on your product. And the, the question is, is what do you apply where and what are the knobs that you're really turning here relative to this whole idea? This is what I actually call the Agile Waterfall Continuum. And its ideal, idea essentially in its most crude form is that early on in small teams, you can be incredibly agile. And because requirements are changing very fast, discovery is still going on. You have a small team that communicates well. Things like documentation, specifications, um, you know, design uh, around your data structures and even the systems, not so important because you have a small team of people who are probably all really good communicating very well, delivering a system. This starts to go out the window when you have 20, 50, 100 engineers developing a much more complex product serving many different market segments. And so all of those things that worked really well at the beginning before the hot coals basically are the exact set of things that are going to get you in trouble longer term as you're scaling. And this just, from my perspective, makes you think about things as you're evolving and scaling the team that you're starting to want to turn this dial to essentially a more and more waterfall way of thinking about a large percentage of your code base. Um, here's a diagram here. This is kind of a lot to digest, but it, it gets into some of the trade-offs that I like to talk about relative to this continuum. Um, in the graph here, um, we have sort of the axis between, um, on the vertical axis, between pure waterfall and pure agile. And at the bottom, or at the top, at the extreme ends of the scale, I'm going to argue that when you go completely one screen or the extreme or the other, you uh, end up in sort of the, the crocodiles and alligators and dragons part of software development. Um, on the other axis, uh, we talk about simpler systems versus more complex systems. The more complex and robust the system needs to be, um, the more perfect it needs to be if you're building heart monitors or drug um, injection equipment or something like that, anything software controlled that's actually mission critical and bugs are completely unacceptable. In a sense, you have to get more towards the water end, waterfall end of the scale. Whereas if you're building sort of web software and fast iteration of a consumer product or Facebook or Google or something where it's just consumer free products, um, you can be more at the fast iteration end of the scale, perhaps make a few mistakes here and there and get away with it. And so what this chart's trying to outline is just how to think about basically this diagonal that runs through the graph, which is um, where you want to be relative to the type of product you're on and what level of scale that you're actually operating at. So I sort of call the, if you have simple systems and you're using pure waterfall, this is sort of uh, what Joel Spolsky calls uh, astronaut, uh, architecture astronauts, um, where we're just over-specifying things and or having unnecessarily long iteration cycles or, or painfully slow software development because of a heavy, heavy process with a relatively simple set of software. Um, the other extreme is where you're using pure agile and you're doing super complex systems, space shuttle software, and um, anything that's sort of mission critical or, or bugs are not acceptable. Um, you know, if you do pure agile with a complex system, you're in Bug City and Refactorville if you operate at that other corner of the graph. And so the idea is, is with this axis across the corner, that you want to think about the different trade-offs that you're making of how you're approaching things based on the size of your team, the complexity of what you're developing, and ultimately what your tolerance is to mistakes or iteration. So the key variables, to put this in a little bit more concrete sense maybe to help you think about it, is what are we really talking about here in terms of what we're going to change or alter as we go through this? Um, the first thing is what's the length of your re release cycle, right? The six, eight, 12 month long cycles of waterfall are clearly something you're probably going to stay away from in most situations. Um, you know, pushing code every day is sort of the other extreme. And it's not inherently bad, but you just need to think about um, what the trade offs here around how well things need to be specified, how well do you understand the problem domain, and how well, uh, how, how much tolerance there is there to I experimenting on your customer base. Clearly, as you get longer, more and more detailed requirements that need to be validated outside of your product through you know, uh, user studies or uh, mock-ups and things like that that are not on the platform and not part of what you're doing for software development. And getting that more formalized feedback starts getting you more and more in the waterfall direction because in a sense you can't afford to experiment on your customer base. Um, what is your clarity and confidence in customer requirements in general? That's pretty much what I was just talking about. Um, how complex is the system? You know, are we doing things with really deep uh, algorithmic kinds of things that either can be tested on the customers, you know, a Google search algorithm, which you can do relatively quickly and easily in an agile way, versus something where we need to put a person on the moon and make sure they hit exactly the right spot without anybody getting killed. Um, not a place to experiment with, exactly. Um, and that leads right to how catastrophic are those defects if they ship. 
And so all of these things together, along with the size of the team and the size of the code base that you have over time, is essentially sort of pushing you from, I'm going to argue, the more agile place that you're going to start off, depending on what your business looks like and what kind of market you're in, more towards water type, waterfall type things, especially in the core services and systems that you expect to remain relatively constant over time as you sort of like, those are the, the iceberg part of things under the water. And then the stuff above the water, um, the small part of the iceberg is the part where you're making little small tweaks and additions that bring together these services in new unique ways as you sort of ship more features um, incrementally to the customer based on that much more solid, more waterfall driven system architecture and design that's under the hood there or under the water in the iceberg analogy. So, and a thing that I want to quickly talk about this um, here, because I'm going to start running out of time, but um, in the session later, we can talk about this quite a bit more, which is why schedules are actually really important. And one of the things that comes up in Agile all the time is why bother spending time in estimation when we can just spec out what we're going to do in some form and then just go code it, and when we're done, we're done. We push it in the next release. Um, it's good on, it sounds good on paper and sounds a good idea. It sounds particularly good to software developers who don't like scheduling or don't want to schedule or are not good at scheduling. But the problem is as your business gets bigger and you have customers in marketing, excuse me, marketing and sales, um, those people care when these things happen. If you want to do coordinated sales and marketing to the field, you have to have schedules and you have to have a relatively long-term roadmap in place that is actually pretty solid, certainly to the quarter quarterly release level, if not to months or even weeks out into the future where six months from now there, we know there's some trade show that we want to launch at or some sort of launch event that we want to coordinate with press, PR, anything that the business really needs. Schedules are super important. The other thing is why scheduling is important is because schedules equal cost relative to development. How long is something going to take? What order are we going to do things in? If you can't estimate things accurately, you have no good way of making cost benefit trade-offs of doing feature development. And in fact, you see a lot of times where people sit down and make roadmap decisions saying, oh, here's an easy feature, here's a hard one, let's do a couple of easy ones first before the hard ones. If they don't turn out to be easy, then you probably or could have made a bad business decision there because your assumptions around which features went in what order had to do with how long they were actually going to take or how much work they are. And so being in touch with that is really important. And the last one that I didn't actually put on the slide is the idea that um, how do you know if you're doing a good job developing software? How do you know you're going fast enough? Are you a relatively slow team or are you a relatively fast team? Most software developers think they're really good and they're fast, but the question is relative to what? And so I'm going to argue that the, the whole idea of scheduling and planning and being able to predictively hit schedules is like your canary in the coal mine for quality of software development. In other words, if you can't have a predictable process about how long things are taking, I'm going to argue that you don't really know what you're doing in terms of how efficiently you're developing. And the idea that if you want to be able to speed up and increase efficiency of the team, th this idea that there's predictability in that and you can look at cost-benefit trade-offs and actually close the loop relative to quality is the only thing that can tell you that um, you're doing a good job and you're developing software fast enough. And so in a sense, if you have an unpredictable software schedules or have an inability to predict well, there's no canary in the coal mine to tell you when things are kind of going wrong. Or to put that around the other way, a signal of, of problems in software development is actually the inability to predict schedules. That means quality and understanding of the code base and what it takes to make that code base successful is starting to slide out the window slowly, basically. Um, lots of different things at play here. So this is all about, um, and this is where I'm kind of running out of time again, but um, we'll quickly try to talk about the fact that um, there's lots of different skills at play. What do you do actually to, to attack these problems that I'm talking about? How do you get efficient development? How do you um, have accurate schedule estimates? And, and the, the main thing to think about here is the fact that there's sort of two different things at play relative to software development. A whole bunch of different skills that are being developed within people, whether it's scheduling and planning, um, designing systems, code construction, debugging, testing. These are all kinds of different skills that must exist within the team, even how to run the compilers and do your build scripts and push code. All these things are different capabilities. Part of what makes you predictable and stable moving forward is that you actually realize that you're trying to separate the idea of um, all of these different skills being developed by the engineering managers in the individual coders and the cadence properties of the team of how fast they're applying those skills to the actual discipline of developing the software. 
And sort of a key way of stabilizing and scaling software development and getting at all these properties that I'm talking about is actually understanding that you basically want to structure the team thinking about engineering in sort of two different ways. How fast are we going relative to cadence? And what are we doing to bring up the skill levels of each one of the people on the team at the various things they need to be doing? As engineering managers and VP of engineering, you really want to be very, very cognizant of essentially where each individual is on in the team relative to those suites of skills that they need to have to be successful at doing predictable, scalable software development. And at least at Stack Overflow and also in uh, my previous companies or teams that I worked on, um, we basically did this through the separation of sort of three different key roles on the team. The developers, obviously, as the team members, developing the code and doing the majority of the heavy lifting. Team leads, who are basically player coaches that are both coding on the team, but are also these sort of walking personifications of the ideal uh, software developer that you want to have that everybody else on the team is sort of modeling. And they're there to sort of mentor the people on the teams and really, in a sense, drive the stand-ups and drive the cadence factors of how software development is being done and keeping that separate from the engineering managers who are specifically um, there for the skills development aspect of it. And so the team leads work in concert with the engineering managers to maintain that separation and focus on cadence maintained by team leads and skills development done by engineering managers. Um, one of the ways I like to talk about this is just in terms of understanding that role separation is kind of like the team leads are the track racing pit crew, and they're there making sure that the car is going around the track at the right speed. And then we have the engineering managers there, um, basically more like the garage mechanics that after the race or in between the races are there overhauling the transmission and the suspension of the cars and making sure that those developers have the, the long-term skills they need for their, their careers. So in summary, um, Minimizing technical debt is all about matching your code base and your data to the market set and how those systems are designed and put together. Predictability highly correlates to quality, meaning schedules are important, and how predictable those schedules are is extremely important. And then understanding this idea that performance doesn't equal results, that you're trying to separate out the idea, did we win the game or lose the game, versus, and how fast did we play the game in a sense, versus um, how well do we um, have these embedded skills and understanding within the teams. So there, the ultimate goal is developing a strong suite of skills in each one of these developers and maintaining that separation of cadence and skill development. Thank you. Any questions? Hi, Jeff. Thank you. There's one question. Uh, can you give an example uh, how the agile techniques interact with the waterfall techniques over time? Um, yeah, the Agile waterfall stuff interacts. Is that what the question was? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, the, the way I usually think of this is that um, I tried to talk about this a little bit earlier in the talk, but the idea was that essentially think of the feature development that's surfacing sort of at the user experience level to the customer is where the most agile stuff is going on in the teams. The most waterfall-driven stuff is your longer-term services and systems that are put together, whether it's major modules or libraries, depending on how your systems are set up, or maybe more in distributed web development where you have many different services running on various platforms. The services that are much slower changing and more constantly there to serve the sort of UX um, uh, Chrome layer of, of the outside of the application, the Chrome layer stuff is the stuff that's going to be the most agile. And the core services of the system are the stuff I'm going to argue you want to have the most structured planning system design and engineering around that is done over much longer um, frequencies of time. And so those, the, the idea of how long, um, you know, what your release cycle should look like is actually going to maybe not even be constant within your whole product and your team. There will be some areas running on much longer release cycles in a more waterfall fashion, and there will be other areas of the same, very same product and other areas that are much shorter iteration cycles and more sort of agile based in a sense. Thank you very much. Cool. Give a round of applause for Jeff. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you.